David. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And um, I, it's a special pleasure for me because back in the 60s when I was working in New York and learning a lot about social activism, I had a chance to meet Albert Shanker a few times. And he made a deep impression on me. So being here at the Institute is really a very special honor and a treat. I started teaching young children in the early 70s. And um, life was quite different then uh, regarding how early childhood was viewed. It wasn't highly respected, I have to say. Helen Blank put her finger on a lot of very good things that have been happening, especially in recent years, about early childhood education and the new appreciation for it. Um, but I've also seen a lot of things that concern me deeply, and I want to talk about that as well. Um, I remember back in the mid-70s, I was invited to an open house at a very good public school in Baltimore. They were very proud of two new developments that they were showing off. The one was open classrooms. They had knocked out a lot of walls and created huge spaces for three or four groups at a time to work together or be subdivided in. And the other was a cognitive approach to kindergarten. And so there were lots of different learning stations, lots of things to do with letters and numbers, and the toy shelves were empty. And I kept thinking, when do they get to play? And finally, the teacher said, OK, you can put away all of the learning things and have free time. And I thought, oh, they, they get to go to that closet over there. That must be where the toys are, and they, now they get to play. No, free time meant um, worksheets that they got to do. So that was 1975, and I've been watching this trend ever since. It's like a snowball that keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So that today when you go into public kindergartens, you're very likely to see very little, if any, play at all. We did surveys a few years ago in 2008 in public kindergartens in New York and Los Angeles and learned that the teachers were spending two to three hours a day on literacy, math, and testing and 20 to 30 minutes on play or choice activities. So that at least the children were having some play, but the balance used to be the other way around, where much more time would be spent in hands-on exploratory learning and play, and less time sitting still in a circle, um, having very good activities sometimes, the sorts of things you're talking about, but in very large doses for children of that age. And if you watch them at circle time, it can be a painful experience as they hold themselves together or try to. And not all of them are so able to hold themselves together. And we don't have data on what's really happening in preschools. In fact, our data on kindergarten is the only data I know of that talks about what's really happening in kindergartens, and that's now five years old. We had hoped it would spark somebody else doing a more national survey. But what we do know, what we hear anecdotally about preschool is that the impact of Common Core, but even earlier other standards, is such that the preschool teachers feel they must get the children ready for very conscious um, literacy skills, things that often are more than what the children actually can do, um, or perhaps should do, let us say, at that age. Perhaps they can do it, but under a lot of stress. Things that they can learn, and there's a lot that they can learn, and I will talk about that, but um, some of the, the skills uh, really demand a lot of time and focus. And what happens, you know, when children get frustrated, girls tend to internalize it, you don't see it as much, boys act out. And so we get a lot of reports of misbehavior, serious misbehavior now, in preschools and kindergartens. And on the, on the uh, slide, you'll see Walter Gilliam's name. He is a professor at Yale University in the Child Development Institute. And he did um, quite a remarkable study a few years ago with um, 4,000 publicly funded preschools. And teachers filled out questionnaires. And he said to me later, I don't know why I put a question about expulsion in there. Nobody was talking about preschool expulsion. Who ever heard of such a thing? But he did put a question in. And what he found was that the rate of expulsion in preschools was now three times higher than the K-12 to expulsion rates. And four and a half times more boys than girls were being expelled, and more African-American children were expelled than Caucasian children. 
He didn't look at poverty levels. But he did look at a number of factors that contributed to it. For example, um, how many hours a day the child was in the program. So the expulsion rates were higher if it was an all-day, extended day, than if it was a half-day program. Um, the ratio of children to teachers was an important factor. If the teacher had too many children, the expulsion rates went up. And he also asked teachers about their stress levels. And he, he showed quite clearly that those who rated their stress levels very low had very low expulsion rates, and those with higher stress levels had higher rates. But the, the well, we then asked him, what about play? Did you look at amounts of play in the preschools? And he said, hmm, no, we didn't look at that. We're always talking about play in the Alliance for Childhood. I'll get to that here, too. Um, but he went home, and he realized that he had included a question about play and that he could do a data run on that. And what he found, was that for the children, and I can't read the numbers now, but for the children who had um, play every day, or almost every day, the expulsion rates were very low. And for the children who had almost no play, the expulsion rates were much higher. Why? What's going on with play? Why is it so important in the education of children as well as in the life of children? For one thing, play integrates everything the child sees, hears, knows, experiences. Nothing gets left out of their play. As a seven-year-old wisely put it, at recess, I remember everything I learned. You know, children take everything and bring it into their play, sometimes in ways that are amusing to us as adults or confusing to us as adults, but it makes perfect sense to them. And, you know, the vocabulary that they use in play is often, to my ears, much richer even than what they use in conversation with adults. I think they know no one's going to correct them in play. They feel very free to try things, to be experimenters with language when they're playing. Um, Sarah Smilansky, an Israeli researcher who also did a lot of work in this country, <coughs> found that the children who were most capable of sociodramatic play, that is make-believe play with other children, who could play for 30 minutes or more with other children, they showed significant gains in language usage, and also in the subtle art of understanding what other people meant. It's subtle. It's not just the words, but what's underneath the words. And children who play well get that. They're doing that with each other all the time. There's some other research I would like to present to you, and you'll also find it in your packet in a couple of articles that I authored or co-authored. But one of them is from High Scope, and we know the High Scope Perry Preschool Study. It's very famous, and it's cited often, and it's been analyzed in the sense of um, for every dollar that you invest in preschool, you'll save, let's say, $7. There's different figures that are used. Um, it's an important study. But at the same time, High Scope did another study that I think is equally important but seldom referred to. And it was called the um, Preschool Curriculum Comparison Study, PCCS. And what it did was to randomly assign low-income children, about 67 children, to one of three different classes. One of them was a High Scope play-based program, which means there was a lot of play and a lot of content from teachers but also with a cognitive element around play, of plan, plan, do, and review. The other was a traditional nursery that, again, had content from the teachers and playtime. And the third was an instructional program that used a scripted program. And in the end, the two play-based programs did not have big differences between them once they took gender into account. So their data gets lumped together. But the differences between the play-based program and the instructional was huge. And it didn't show up at first. At the end of the first year, High Scope said, there's no differences. There's accelerated learning in all three groups. IQ went up quite a bit in all three groups. And other skills went up in all three groups. They could not see a difference. 
but they followed those children to age 23. And that's where, along the way, real differences came up. So for instance, who needed special education? The children from the play-based group, 6% needed it. But the children in the instructional group, 47% of those children needed special education along the way. And that figure just grips me every time I deal with this. It's shocking and horrible and true. And I've seen it myself when a child is misplaced too soon in an academic program. The child was diagnosed as having serious learning disabilities, should be sent to a specialized school. And then she was brought back to the kindergarten for another half a year, went on to first grade, went right on through school, never showed a sign of learning disability. Learning disabilities are tricky things to get right. Some children have them innately, true, but not all. We are creating a lot of problems for our children. And then there are other measures that came about later in life, such as being arrested for felonies, a big difference, 9% play-based children, 34% for the instructed children. And being suspended from work, none of the children from the play-based program were, whereas 27% of the others were, and so on. You can see the figures. Um, so whether children get the right education or not in pre-K can impact their whole life. It's not just how they'll do in kindergarten, how they'll do in the grades, or even high school. It, it really lays a foundation for life, and it's important that we get it right, and that we, in a way, humble ourselves and ask ourselves, are we doing it right for children? If you look at the NAEP scores, for instance, NAEP has charts up for the last 21 years. Um, and I looked at it thinking, well, with all the attention we've paid in literacy, we should be seeing significant gains in growth in literacy. NAEP is scored on a, a table of 500 points, not 100. So I was hoping to see a 10% growth over 21 years, maybe a 5% growth, 1% growth over 21 years in fourth grade literacy a little bit more than 1% in eighth grade literacy. We really have to stop and say, what are we doing? Are we doing the best we can for children? Or are we, in fact, creating some additional problems, especially for children in low-income communities? One other piece of research, and then I'll move on. In Germany, they did a large study. Back in the 70s, they also wanted to shift their kindergartens from being play-based to academic-oriented. And they did a study of 50 groups, kindergarten groups, that were play-based, 50 that were academic, followed them through fourth grade, a study that I wish we had done in this country while we still had play-based kindergartens to look at. We do have some, but not so many. What, here's what they found. They looked at the children. They followed the children to age 10. And they found, again, that the children from the play-based kindergartens excelled over the other children in the 17 different measures that they used, which included academic measures, but also social-emotional measures. And it included um, an industry, and it included language, oral expression, reading. But I, I love industry. I come from a German background. Uh, Germans are very industrious, and they're probably the only country that would put that in as one of their measures. But it's an important measure. Can children stick with things? Yeah, they, they need to stick with things. Um, Germany took this seriously. They switched all their kindergartens back to being play-based in the 70s. They're succumbing to modern pressures as well um, and moving a little bit away from that now. <coughs> um, so what is it that children then need? I would say what they really need is what we call play-based experiential learning. And that includes all of the rich work around books and language that Susan Newman was talking about. But it also includes time for children to do their own exploration and discovery, their own play. It was Ashley Montague, the anthropologist, who said, when children play, it is like watching a scientist in the lab. They are constantly engaged in a what-if process. What if I build it this way? What if I put one more thing on top? Whoops. Yeah, it can't balance. What if I go up to a strange child and ask to play? That's taking a big chance, right? I 
might say no, might hit me, might do anything. What if, what if children's lives are full of this kind of discovery of a what if? Nowadays in science education, there's a lot of talk about inquiry-based learning. Young children engage in inquiry-based learning all the time. If we let them, if we encourage them, if we encourage them to discover, learn, bring it all together in play, and then they're ready for the next big dose yeah, of what we can offer. And we have a lot to offer as teachers, both in terms of print literacy, but very much in terms of oral language, which is critical to the building up towards print literacy. So storytelling is a lost art that needs to be retrieved again. When you tell a story to a child and you see their face and this space between you and the child, it is an amazing experience. It took me a while to get over my fears of storytelling, but I will tell you it's an incredible experience. And enhanced with puppetry and <coughs> acting out stories and all the things that let children dive in deeply. Also nursery rhymes. We did them every day in my preschool kindergarten. You know, it's a rich language for children. Songs, verses, combined with all sorts of physical activities that really enhance the children's sense of the world around them and their life. So combining real work, real activity with language, with books, bringing all of it together so it makes one complete sense to the child. It makes sense to them. And they thrive on it. And I've seen this in homeless shelters where I've done volunteer work. I've seen it in an inner city school here where I went and did storytelling every week. I will tell you that the looks on the children's faces are exactly the same as when you're working with children out here in the suburbs of Maryland where I did my teaching. They are absorbing as deeply as any child from a home where the parents have advanced degrees. You don't see a difference when you're working out of play-based experiential learning. You, you see the children absorbing and using and growing and developing. And I've seen it also in elementary schools and high schools when the arts are integrated in, even in a maximum security prison for youth. Fabulous teaching when the arts are integrated in with the education. So there's so much that we can do, and I want to conclude with the three areas that I would most like to see happen. If someone gave me a magic wand and said, you get three wishes for early education. The one is that we set appropriate developmental goals for learning. I don't happen to think that the Common Core kindergarten goals are appropriate for children. And I had wanted to go more into that, but I spoke too long about other things. The, the basic kindergarten reading goal is to read um, emerging literacy literature with fluency and understanding by the end of kindergarten. The only saving grace in it is nobody knows what emergent literature is, so it gives us some room for flexibility. Other reading ones in there, or literacy ones, say with support. This one doesn't even say with support. Just read with fluency and understanding. So set developmental, developmentally appropriate goals for children. And then do a broad-based assessment that is not only looking at the cognitive gains that children do, but how are they doing physically how are they doing with their hands? Children are, I would say, crippled today. They don't know how to use their hands anymore. And it's a serious problem. And the more we give them screens that they can learn through a fingertip, the bigger the problem is. And many public schools now use occupational therapists to work with the children to help them overcome um, the lack of handedness that they have. And finally, really prepare teachers and support them in play-based experiential learning. It's, it's become a bit of a lost art. And um, I know many universities now have to follow so many requirements for state certification of their teachers that they, that they complain that there's no time to teach about play and experiential learning. So we need to um, revise some of that, and we need to support teachers in ways that really help them become solid practitioners based experiential learning. Thank you.